And yes. no good. Perfect. So we are recording. So welcome to um, this is our second seminar in our um, Ask Mom series. And today the um, our guest speaker is um, uh, Sheila Kathleen Jennings. And Sheila is one of our board members for one of our two board members for Ontario. Um, she um, has been on the Mom Stop the Harm leadership for uh, several years now. I don't remember how many years exactly, Sheila. But um, uh, Sheila has been instrumental in um, contributing to our efforts, not only in Ontario, but also on the national level, representing us on forums with Health Canada and such. And um, um, I will let Sheila um, uh, tell us a little bit more about her academic present credentials and that she will then move into presenting her course. Um, if you have questions while Sheila is presenting, um, we suggest that you keep yourself mu muted and use the chat feature. And at the end, um, with this being a small group, we will have a lot of time to engage in conversation okay. with Sheila. Sheila, over to you. Thank, Thank you very Sarah. much for volunteering to do this. Oh, no, my pleasure. It's actually really nice to have the opportunity to debrief at the end of this course. So, um, yeah, so I used to practice uh, child welfare and family law back in the day. And I returned to school and I uh, did my doctorate at Oxford Hall Law School. And I convocated with that degree in October. And... Uh, it was a long time coming. It was a long time to get that degree. It took me seven and a half years. I took off uh, two and a half years to do crisis care for my son uh, and then returned to it. At that point, I'd sort of forgotten about what I'd been researching and even questioned whether I should bother, but I'm really glad that I did. And uh, teaching uh, a course in the opioid crisis is one of the wonderful things that came out of what were really uh, rolling catastrophic events uh, on a personal and a familial and an economic level for us. So I've called this, um, I'm just going to roll into it because some more about me will uh, come up as I talk about why this course, for example, because mostly what I teach is in the area of legal studies. Uh, so I've called it with an eye on design and first point I wanted to make was that going into this, I didn't know what really design meant. Uh, so it seemed really bold for me to apply for this position. Uh, I had a vague notion. I've learned so much, uh, so much more about what design is and so much more about what design can do from my students. So things I learned and realizations that I had <clears throat> from these amazing graduate students in the field of design for health uh, are things I'm going to be uh, relaying as we move forward. Before we do that, <clears throat> I'd like to just mention briefly, how did my teaching this course come about? And it was a little bit of serendipity for about two years Anybody who would listen would hear me say, oh, if you know of anybody who'd like to have an opioid, opioid course taught, I'd be interested. So I approached someone at York University. I approached someone at a university uh, in the GTA. Uh, I approached someone at uh, a local college. Uh, I asked and met with Dr. Joel Lexton, who's an expert on drug policy and you know, he thought that maybe at York University in a course on drug policy that perhaps I could come in and give one lecture. And then some, another university told me, look, there's just no appetite for an entire course to be provided on the opioid crisis. And I actually accepted that. But I did meet with Dr. Joel Lexchin, who I actually had a class with back in the 80s, in the dark ages at McGill. Uh, and he's quite a remarkable man. He's, he's been in the news a lot over the decades. But uh, I met with him for coffee in the summer, last summer. And I said, were I to teach a course on the opioid crisis, how would I go about structuring a course outline? Like, what would you recommend? And he, he gave me an hour of his time. 
And he said, you know, you can just start with the old legislation, start with the early acts uh, and the racism that's embedded in that legislation and go forward from there. Uh, so that's exactly what I did. Now, in this uh, set of slides, what I taught actually appears at the end. And it's not because it's, it's lesser, it's because I want to make sure that um, I cover the projects that I ask the students to do. Uh, but at the end, you can see what they learned and what we talked about that informed their posters. And this was really striking to me and it really hit home to me that one of the problems that we see with so much of the de health design now is that the people who are designing them, no offense, um, because they mean well in government actually don't really get it. And so their posters really reflect that. Uh, and there's a lot we can talk around uh, about that. But in any event, I was looking for something to teach in the spring. And I saw two things. I saw a, a position at Ryerson University in disability in the law. And I thought, well, I know that I can do a module on addiction in that. And I was hired to do that uh, course, which is really fun and, and also really neat students. And I saw uh, a posting for uh, OCAD University. And what a wonderful bunch of people there. And even though I don't have a, a PhD in health policy and I don't have a PhD in drug policy per se, um, they trusted enough to let me uh, go on with this notion of I can do this, I can teach this course. And interesting to me, it didn't end up being a really kind of a legalistic course. We, there wasn't huge focus on decriminalization, for example. So the course itself, is a, it's a program, is called Design for Health, and it's a graduate level program and students coming in get a master's in Design for Health. Um, and on their website, if you go and look, it says it is a degree program that responds to the complexity of healthcare through a comprehensive, academically rich design approach. It empowers designers to create ethical, sustainable solutions pressing challenges across the health sector. And there's nothing more challenging than the opioid crisis, in my view. It was here before COVID, and it's going to be here by the looks of it when COVID has long gone. Um, and it's a huge challenge. So it ab absolutely fits the bill uh, here. So as I mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm not an artist, and it wasn't, I knew that there was, uh, within the field of intellectual property law, that there is a uh, industrial design legislation. And I thought maybe design relates to that. And maybe that is where they go to get their designs registered. I don't know. I, that would be the limit of my understanding. Um, but one of the things uh, that I did learn very quickly is that there is a huge role for design to move things forward. There's a role within advocacy. There's a role within policy. There's a role within law and also to educate and inform government. So the course I taught was always, it's been taught there for years, uh, several years. It's not that this course was created uh, for me and I didn't come up with a name. It's Special Topics Opiate Crisis Course. Um, but this year was, I believe, the first year it was taught online, which of course makes a difference. Um, I think this actually facilitated my uh, teaching it because to go into a studio and be dealing with graphics and things was, was beyond the scope of my expertise for sure. One of the things that I really enjoyed teaching this course was at the end of a sort of an academic lecture, the first sort of eight lectures were fairly structured. Uh, at the end of that, we would critique together uh, designs from different healthcare crises, right? So we would have a day where we'd have uh, from the AIDS crisis, different uh, government work, uh, community work, advocacy designs, and then we would critique those as a group. And it was a real education for me uh, to hear those uh, critiques from the students. So 
they would talk about whether the call to action within the design was effective and the contrast of the colors and the look and feel of the item and so on. So not only did I learn a great deal in that process about how powerful design is, I started to contemplate that design really has a potential to be majorly powerful. And I've always had this feeling actually since even before this course from looking at some posters, government and other, in this book by Jennifer Breyer called Infectious Ideas. And it really strikes me from what she's saying is that some of the problems within uh, the AIDS health crisis was addressed visually. The power of the visual images moved different populations. And so that's something that came up for me while I was, was doing this. So all in all, uh, this course consisted of 36 hours of teaching time. So it was Wednesday and Friday, three hours each day, starting at 8.30 in the morning. And I'm just listing here, you know, what we went through in those hours. So we did the history of drug policy, as I mentioned. Uh, we did health harms of the war on drugs. And then we had six hours looking at community resistances, because for me, I feel that that's one of the things that designers have to get at and get underneath and get around. And if they can find a way to do that, that seems to me to be one of the big stumbling blocks right now is resistance to changing the status quo. Young minds, young brains, young people with their finger on, on the pulse of the culture, but there were also some people in the class in their mid forties um, who brought something in as well. In, uh, on May the 29th, we looked at com different communities significantly affected by the opioid crisis. And of course that related to the assignments. If you're going to be trying to address the needs of a particular community, what kind of design and where and how and what for and all of that might differ rather than the current one size fits all, right? That we, we tend to see. And we also looked, had an academic morning where we looked at critical addiction, critical disability and progressive medical approaches. So we looked at Jillian Cola's work with Sarah Ovens and Zoe Dodd and Watson, I don't remember their first name, uh, around different ways of framing what's going on in the opioid crisis, different ways of framing it as, you know, a health crisis even, as more of a reflection of structural inequities uh, within Canadian society. And one of the classes that I very much uh, enjoyed, if I may use that word, was the June 5th class on harm reduction leadership. And that was a class where I really felt that everyone was super focused and very interested. Uh, so we talked about Vicki Reynolds, Sarah Blythe, Peter Leslie, Zoe Dodd, and a few other people as well. And on June 10th, we talked about um, various debates within Safe Supply. And it was clear in that class that some people were really struggling to get their head around it. Um, some people really felt that it was irresponsible. Some people pr uh, presented their view that it was irresponsible to use drugs and you know, the responsibility piece was there still. So um, a couple of those people sent me really nice uh, emails later on. So there was movement within people and between people on how they were perceiving what was happening. And that was really gratifying. Actually, it was gratifying that they were open and listening. Um, thanks, Lorna. Lorna sent me a chat. Two things that were quite difficult to watch were in the last two classes, but they knew they had the heads up. They watched Flood uh, after the first, very first class. They went home, well, they were already at home. They watched Flood and we came back and we talked about that uh, on, two days later. However, um, on these two particular days, we watched uh, two Ontario uh, documentaries and I've, I've put the links in here uh, so the one with um, saving rabbit seemed to really resonate with all of the students and um, it was very hard for me to watch that and it's hard for me to even talk about that 
this was a really lovely soul, uh, this young man. And he was so gentle. Uh, so it was really hard to watch that. But it was, as somebody on privately said, uh, his aim in making this and having himself be exposed in this way was to educate and that he would have been happy to have known that the students at OCAD were watching this uh, video and that was gratifying. It's just that I'm always having this feeling. This is on a personal level now um, with also my son's friend dying in April of uh, how many more young people need to make movies like this and how many more towns, for example, in the Vice video, how many more towns have to have be exposed um, to film crews coming in uh, and filming their young people in crisis before something happens. But in any event, these, these stimulated a lot of conversation. And I believe that the impacts of these conversations that they had is reflected in the really high quality of their work. They got it. They really got it. <clears throat> so in addition then to attending or listening uh, to six hours a week of lectures, and I see a typo there, every PowerPoint I, I do has at least one and then I have to go back and fix it, um, which were recorded. And then what I'm moving into now is their uh, projects. Uh, the students had to undertake three projects that honed in on specific issues within the opioid crisis. Um, and unfortunately, I, it was my, my bad. I didn't ask um, the students about whether or not I could share their podcast, but I have to tell you that other than, for example, um, the Crackdown podcast, which is a very high quality, slick, meaningful production. These were like, like that. These were really, really well done. Uh, and in the podcasts, um, we had something that they had to do, which, which resonated with an extremely marginalized uh, community in the States that has been studied very nicely um, by Bourgeois and uh, Schoenberg, two very cool guys in California in a book called Righteous Dope Fiend. And so they had to use the images in that book for their, for their podcast. But what, the, what we focus on here is their poster posters and uh, some of their billboards. Now there were uh, nine graduate students in the class and I think it was three students auditing and the students who audited didn't need to provide anything. And just before I go into talking about <clears throat> the two assignments that I'm going to show you samples from, um, the students did provide their permission. They sent the things with uh, their information on. And so it's just a shout out. If you see something that you think has promise or, you know, that could be modified for something that interests you or that you're working on, their uh, contact information is on the poster itself. Uh, and if you can't read it for whatever reason, I can provide it. But I can tell you to every last student, they were friendly, open, approachable, uh, which again was really uh, fantastic. So the first uh, project that they had to do was a poster and we did spend quite a lot of time looking at posters that were prepared, including those by the federal government of Canada. And I found it really helpful to hear this, the graduate students critique the posters by the federal government of Canada because they talked about the, this idea that maybe those posters were put together by several people and then they had filters on them. And so they were dis at a distance and they had looked like a cool medium, um, which you know you might well expect for government. Um, I'm just, it, will you please excuse me for one second? My dog is barking. Welcome, Sherry. Glad you could join us. Um, I sent you a message. I hope you're okay with recording and then you can watch the remainder of the presentation later. I'm so sorry about that. 
Oh, don't, don't worry. You know, that's why we are recording. <laughs> We've got technology. <laughs> right, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Glad okay. you can be here. Right. So when we, um, we finish critiquing other government posters, well, other posters from different domains, uh, we then talked about what was going to inform their assignment. And we talked about the Business Association lawsuit in Edmonton. Uh, that tried to prevent safe consumption site uh, presence and wanting to have the three be put into one and the whole sort of idea that they hadn't been consulted and then what the court said. So, uh, and they were very interested in that. Uh, and then their assignment that they did ha uh, required the creation of a design for a health promotion poster of their own for a, a fictional provincial public health campaign directed towards uh, the general public. And the design of the poster, and not everybody managed to get every last thing in, and it was a lot of asks for this poster. But the design needed to address the issues raised by attendees at hypothetical public dialogues held to address NIMBY in a given community. And it also had to address the government's newly acquired evidence-based perspective that uh, a community rejection with, with respect to safe consumption site existence and location is based on unfounded fears. So the idea was that they were to do something that would visually address that. And it also had to, to deal with the, the view that not in my backyard qualifies as discrimination in the area of provincial health, if they could work that in. So there were rubrics um, that I used for each uh, item. And I provided uh, an article about that legal case uh, from a on a similar issue so that they could look at that if they wanted to contemplate a little bit more about all that was involved and all went into it. Because it was important for me to know that they could understand the scope and the breadth and the depth of the, you know, it's a it's a junkyard dog fight around some of these issues, actually. And I thought it was really important for them to know that. Uh, and then I also provided the students with a sample poster regarding use of language in the drug crisis. And I learned without going into particulars that this was actually quite challenging for some individuals uh, to go along with and that language is very powerful and it's hard to uh, relearn it or to drop old language and that it does carry a lot with it. Uh, so when the students critiqued one another's work, they were able to bring up these criticisms, but I did not do that because I didn't want to criticize the students uh, given that they were making big effort and, um, and other students could step in and have that conversation, which they did do in a nice way. There were, it was uh, very constructive criticism and no harsh criticism towards one another. So the other things about the poster were it needed to be printable for a public space uh, and available via link uh, by this artificial uh, health office region. And um, this is a similar issue that I've already uh, addressed. So they needed to deal with uh, the viewpoints that were expressed in this dialogue. And I know I've been to a couple of dialogues and the thing that's so difficult about them, as I went to two at Toronto City Hall, is that views are quite uh, disparate and diverse. Uh, even though, you know, well, in Toronto, it felt like a lot of people who were supportive of harm reduction were there, there were still diverse, there were still diverse views. So this is what they had to deal with and I, I won't have time to go into all of the details, um, but this is, this is what they were looking at. 50% of the attendees approved safe consumption in equity region. Uh, half feared children finding used needles. So then they could be addressing these kinds of issues. 30% said no, uh, because drug consumption is illegal. 
some said whatever it takes. Uh, and then some folks would have uh, said it's a human rights violation not to assist. And then ha these were some of the more technical uh, requirements that they needed to have in place. I'm losing my cursor for whatever reason. Uh, these are other technical requirements. Uh, and this was part of the learning curve for me because I'm marking these things. Uh, and one of the things that I learned that I will share here is, is not to make a, a very snap judgment about a design. So I kind of launched into uh, evaluating the design. And of course, one of the students said, you know, we usually sit and look at the design and feel the effect of the design on us and then start to not really take it apart, but think about what is it saying and how is it saying it and a lot of other kinds of questions. And I realize how much I take for granted pretty much anything visual I see, including on the subway. I just do this quick thing without appreciating the vast amount of thought and planning that went into it. Um, and I didn't grade for um, style. Obviously, some of them had a vibe that really appealed to me, but we all have different tastes and there's no accounting for taste. So I would comment, oh my goodness, I love your color scheme, um, but it might not be someone else's favorite color scheme or they might not like the poster, but uh, yeah. So I'm going to get into showing you a few posters. Um, and this is, uh, her nickname is Mina Nirjana. And uh, so, and she's a graduate student, obviously. And this was her poster um, trying to address all of those things that came up at the dialogue, which obviously isn't simple. So she has boost care, not fear, safe consumption sites, safe communities. And then she has safe injection equals right to health equals human rights. I've got my chat over overlapping this here. Um, right, so then at the bottom she has crime is not rising. Safety is not affected. And it just hits you in the face. And this uh, photo she and I talked a little bit about because uh, it's such a powerful photo. This is Pandora, who was a friend of my son's who passed away a couple of years ago. And just it's just such a powerful image of her. And this photo was from CBC. And so what we talked about was uh, how do you get a model to evoke what Pandora was evoking as she was dying? Uh, because this picture just gives me goosebumps. She's just so, uh, just so powerful. But we talked about uh, with the group about the importance of having an image of a person that can reach your heart and not a sterile image of flat faces who all look the same, which we saw on the stigma campaign um, with the federal government. And I don't know what the process there is for vetting posters and they obviously have their own internal standards and so on and so on. But for me, I feel something like this is very evocative and would speak to would speak more to more people, would speak more loudly to more people. I mean, there's always gonna be people that say, you know, I don't like chicks with green hair. I mean, you're not gonna, you know, people, there's very narrow-minded conservative people, um, but I honestly don't believe they make up the primary majority of, of any province. So I'm sure people have things to say about these, so I'm, I am trying to, have it so that we have time at the end. Um, this is Susan Wolf's uh, poster. Now she's the one person in the class who, who told me that she wasn't someone who did graphic design for a living. And I believe her background was uh, medical anthropology. And uh, she just contributed wonderfully uh, to the class. But she said I could share it and I love it. I love that it's a black and white, on this side and then you've got this warm yellow color and the tone that draws you in and it's clean and the juxtaposition of the word safer inside um, it speaks a lot to everything that was in the dialogue so safer 
safe consumption sites in at the bottom. They're not what you think. And then a list of their benefits right there. And it's, and it's so simple, right? So I'm going to, you can always go back and if this is posted and take a look uh, again. And this is Ritika's uh, poster, which is, uh, to me, it reminds me a little bit of um, the Mexican artist, Frida Calho. It reminds me a little bit of Frida Calho. It's very rich on the colors and it's, it's striking. And, um, and it's different, you know, just on that basis alone, it's, it's got a different feel to it. And so, you know, I don't think she said which community it was directed at, but to me, it's like this could be in a fashion district or something like that. Um, and the butterfly is, is beautifully presented. And um, she is Southeast Asian, and this is in the middle of her forehead. Uh, hate, stigma, and judge with, with a line through it. And I really like the colors. So I found this very striking. Uh, and to me, this would have durability because it's also art. And this is Yes Means uh, poster. It, might, it may be the last one uh, before we move on. Uh, and there's a lot in it, but that also, it also has the feel to me of a government style or you know, provincial health department poster. Uh, and she did address everything in the uh, rubric that she needed to do. So she's got her statistics. Um, she has a call to action or a message, choose life over fear, which is, which is the message, right? It's, it is, if you believe that uh, safe consumption refusal is fear driven, then you have to address that somehow. And her way of doing that was choose life over fear. Uh, yeah, so I think you'd probably need a little bit more time to absorb everything she's go that's going on here. And she had it be put out this one by the government of Canada. And she felt that this was something along their uh, style. And it's got good contrast for people who have, uh, who need contrast to be able to read it. They've got low vision or something of that nature. And I can sort of skip over this. Um, this was the podcast that I don't have samples of. And uh, these were just so professionally done. I had no idea that people had that capacity. And the tones of their voices reached out to people. I realized that this is another way, if you can get people to listen to it, and eight minutes isn't that long, um, you know, it might be a viable way to advocate. I, I mean, Garth Mullins is doing that in, in, in a really neat way. So, but for these guys, for my students, they had to deal in a podcast with the triple threat that we've had in Toronto, but also in various locales. I know Vancouver had it, um, dealing with homeless individuals who use uh, opioids and whatever, I mean, meth um, and other substances in the current uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And, uh, and, to, and to refer back to one of um, Jeff uh, Schomer's uh, uh, photos in Righteous Dope Fiend, Fiend, and they did it incredibly well. It was, very, it was very effective. And it seems a shame that I can't play them for you. <laughs> so these are their the way that they needed to proceed through their uh, podcast. Um, Sheila, yes. maybe at the end, um, we can try to play one if you have a sample. I don't, I don't have one, but I will ask for one. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes means and see if I can add it afterwards. Yes means was, uh, it was just, it was just amazing actually. Yeah. And it, so, it's my bad because I didn't actually specifically ask them for that. So what they provided were the posters and the billboards. But I would like to definitely would like to share them with you. Uh, so in terms of the billboard, before I did the rubric for, the, for this, 
I actually had a really interesting time. I just went into the news media and into Google Images. Well, first I looked at what, what makes a good billboard and how do you go about that? And for something that I've driven by all my life and never thought about, right? It's just a billboard. And as people at Mom Stop the Harm know, um, I, from when it came out, it was very taken by the film uh, Three Billboards. And, um, and then of course, Mom Stop the Harm have done uh, signs on the side of buses, which are almost the size of a billboard. And those are very powerful. Uh, but they had to d design a billboard uh, directed towards a specific marginalized and more impacted population of choice um, to encourage them not to use alone. It was very simple. That was the one thing for the billboard, it, you know, just one message. Um, and what was a surprise to me was their, their, a billboard to them meant much more than it did to me. So I had a vision of two wooden sticks and a big board out in the middle of a field and things were being handed in beautiful works on the side of a building, which of course is a billboard, but I just hadn't really anticipated it. But the billboard that they were provided with uh, as an image was one of the dozens of huge industrial size, not very attractive billboards in the United States that you see around using Narcan. And they're everywhere. I had no idea about that either, but I found one and it's in a field. It's, it's very industrial looking. Uh, and they didn't go with the industrial approach, even though that's what, what I had provided them with. And this is that you can, uh, should I open it? I might, I might mess it up, but maybe I shouldn't. Yeah, I think I won't. Um, so the assignment details were that they, that it wasn't to be just a generic billboard because one of the things that I've been thinking about is that advocacy might best target specific populations or age groups or demographics rather than uh, a larger group. So one of the things they had to decide was where the billboard would be. Would it be Toronto, Barrie, Durham Region, Brampton, outside the works? So the city works in Toronto is where people go for their methadone, Suboxone, and there, there was an informal safe consumption site in there where you go in and uh, use inhalants and so on, and they would uh, make sure that you were safe. Uh, or is it an intersection of Church and Wellesley and somebody actually, uh, I think somebody might be one of the ones I'm showing you is at that intersection. Uh, specific, uh, what is a specific message to that community? Is it going to be slightly nuanced? Is the message nuanced or not? And why or why not? And then use of a statistics being, op statistic being optional. And uh, I could have added use of uh, a piece of evidence-based research because I like to uh, anchor what's being said in science for the naysayers to have to grapple with rather than just here's the facts and we expect you to do the right thing. I thought, I feel that that anchoring is, is quite helpful. With the billboards, they had to provide quite detailed documents that outlined all of these things. So they showed maps, which showed hotspots in a given region. So Barrie's a hotspot, it's a town or village, small city. Where is the hotspot? And then target the billboard to that in a, more, in a very specific way. They also needed to know the specific issues of the location. And so I'll show you, um, this is near Jana's, uh, part of, I mean, she had quite a spectacular PDF pamphlet almost with what it would look like when it was up and in different locales. Um, and so she did pick Barry and then she had to zoom in lenses on what that area of town was like and the problem specific to Barry. And uh, she has this, I believe, uh, 
would be down in this area and it and it talks about the not her statistic is 67 young lives were lost to over overdose in Barrie in 2018 and it's the simple message it shows naloxone keep the naloxone close keep the friends closer stay together stay alive never use alone it's like the boom the boom the boom uh, and it's for them right it's speaking to this community um, and I know that Barry has uh, a percentage of the population there are indigenous uh, youth so then this would need to have uh, images that reflected that as well this was specifically tailored to the demographic that her research talked about as as having been most at risk uh, in Barrie in this time frame. And this is Yes Means, and she provided really uh, a package. So she provided uh, this beautiful poster that would be up uh, down near Union Station in downtown Toronto, quite high up, that would be paired or supported by lamp post wraparound posters that would grab people's attention and so for me it just looks like this lone lone person sitting down like that and we've all seen it over and over and over this heartbreaking lone person who who people walk by and they don't look at them they are outside society and this this just looks like a nighttime moon or the sun's gone down you know uh, but she says, we don't want to lose you. You don't have to use alone. Two simple sentences. Uh, and then she has it be the logo that she, they all had to provide a logo and then an, uh, a contact. So she has it called overdose prevention site. Uh, someone else provided one that said two blocks east of where you're sitting right now, there's a safe consumption site or, you know, community health center where you can go. And you know, this is on my laptop. You'd want to be looking at these in a much larger <clears throat> format than I have here because they're so much more impactful when they're large. So this is what she sent as her wraparound that go with them. Uh, she called them light post wraparounds. So really it, it starts to become a little bit of a campaign where you have more pieces to it. Uh, and then this is what her billboards would look like in downtown Toronto, she says. So you can see uh, this is a real photograph and she's managed to situate them on that. It made me think that um, the one up here would be cool if it had light behind it, like it, if it was more like a screen of a laptop rather than paper, or if it was a shiny substance. And at least, you know, we don't have this. But we should, because this would acknowledge uh, what's going on. And I have to say, today, I was on the subway in Toronto, and I haven't been on the subway or to a public venue of any kind. Like, I went to the hairdresser today on the subway, and I was astounded. There are big signs, huge signs. We really strongly encourage you to wear a mask, please. Oh, okay, that's a health message, and I'm getting it, and my mask is firmly on. And then I get on the subway, and there are signs that someone's designed so that you can't sit next to someone. You're three and four seats away from everybody. And so those have been designed as well. And so I obeyed that. But there was health messaging all around me for COVID um, and we were all obeying it. So this, it, this shouldn't be a far cry. So then the question is why don't we have this? Um, why is there so much resistance? I even tried with Mayor Tory saying, if I would like to have some young people that I know do a mural, can you give me a wall? Right? No, I never got a response. So one of the comments I'd like to make, and it's, it's oh, it's, I've still got a little bit of time, a few minutes anyway, is that uh, I wasn't sure how participation would go in this course. Uh, I came in and basically feel like I just laid all of my stuff on the table. Uh, this is who I am. And uh, I had some photos of my son and I, with Rory and I, in there and shared some of 
the thoughts that he allows me to share. <clears throat> but there was high participation in this. And there was also early on, for some individuals, quite high distress. They, they exhibited signs of high distress, and that concerned me early on. But, uh, you know, it, it went away or it didn't, it didn't get manifested and didn't talk, cause people to drop out, which was good. Uh, and so there was a lot of sharing of ideas openly, but there was also a lot of frank shock. A lot of people were just so unaware, even though they've heard about fentanyl and they know someone who knows someone and so on, they, they seemed genuinely surprised at some of the information that was coming their way and then very concerned. So I realized that there is a huge power in education and one can probably roll something out in all different domains, like in engineering and reach people that way, uh, because they're definitely interested. So I will whip through this section so that we can talk, but the range of topic areas were broad and I did that even though it meant that we couldn't dig down into them deeply because I wanted them to have a good umbrella overview of what's gone on and what's going on. So we looked at uh, the early days of the war on drugs and I actually opened the course by reading a, uh, from Johan Hari's book, um, Chasing the Scream. I read them the story of Billy Holiday's death with Anzinger in the narcotics, uh, Federal Bureau of Narcotics in the US. And uh, as a way to kind of set the tone for the class. And that worked really well for me. It wasn't an academic approach. It was, look at this incredible singer who was lost because of the war on drugs and the way she was treated because of the war on drugs. And so, and they were very interested in that. And so we moved on from that into stigma and discrimination and uh, these other areas, which I mentioned, these tie into the list of courses uh, sorry, the list of lecture titles. Uh, so we looked at all of these areas. And we had a focus uh, with one exercise on this. Uh, and also, um, this was where the podcast rested in this area. And I made a list before I did my <clears throat> lectures of people that I wanted them to know about that perhaps they could relate to as young people. Um, and so these are people we talked about or whose work we talked about. And so they listened to an interview of Johan Hari uh, speaking. They listened to uh, a very long 45 minute lecture that Hakik Barani gave to medical people that generated a lot of conversation. Uh, they listened to Mark Kindle talk for about half an hour. They listened to uh, Andrea Sereda talk for about 20 minutes. And that really gave them the flavor of all these different areas of expertise and things that people are doing. I talked about uh, Kathy Wagner's experience of trying to get services for her son and one, I, I chose Tristan because uh, it was an example to me of someone who his mother had, was on the ball and had a lot of resources. And so she took him to Japan and I'd read the Ian Hannah Mansing piece where she's there and she's interviewing her just to show that you cannot point fingers. People have done what they can do and uh, nobody, you cannot blame this young man. You can't blame his, his mother. Um, and from there, I went on to talk about, we talked about trauma and uh, a little bit about what Layla Attar had talked about at the Opioid Symposium, uh, about her experience of rehab. We talked a lot about rehab because people still seem to feel that that's the route. And we talked about that. Um, and we talked about um, the importance of never giving up on changing norms. And uh, we talked about Candy Leitner and her children being in car accidents with inebriated drivers and how that was totally okay. That was a norm. It was a norm that someone could leave a party loaded and knock your car and kill your daughter. And this wasn't a crime. It was an accident. 
and how because of her, norms changed. And so norms can change. I was just trying to make that point to them and how, you know, they are probably too young to even know who, who she is. Um, so we talked about her for a bit. And then we talked about folks in different affected communities. And uh, I talked a little bit about my son's friend here who passed away on my birthday this year. Um, and we talked about uh, Esther Tailfeathered work that she does. I think I'm missing an S on that. And um, Pandora, who was quite outspoken as a homeless advocate. So uh, these are people that we considered. We looked at various print sources, quite a few different print sources, actually. I managed, I managed to PDF thing, things. And we talked about documentary filmmakers and their role which is sort of akin to a design role, right? It's the use of a creative format to educate and promote health and bring about change. And probably uh, Lorna could speak to that a lot more than I can. I just know that I was very impacted by uh, Peter Saunders and, uh, and Julian Souza's uh, CBC documentary uh, about uh, the opioid crisis and how it affected them. So that can be a powerful tool if you can get people to watch it. And we watch videos. <clears throat> Our final group exercise of the entire course <clears throat> was that I asked the students to find one person online who made a contribution or a difference in the world and who also used illicit substances and to tell us something interesting else about that person's life, about the, other than the fact that they use substances, what did they do? And actually, Petra, two people selected chefs. And so we talked about the world of being a chef and how uh, competitive it was and how artistic it was. And that was a lovely conversation. Uh, and I went first by way of example. <clears throat> and I talked about one of my favorite singers and I posted one of his songs actually in, in a, one of our groups with Mom Stop the Harm, which is Lowell George. And Lowell actually got in trouble for one of the songs he wrote which was, a, was about um, weed, whites, and wine. But his death was a huge loss to music. And people, uh, major stars, still talk about the role that he played in mentoring them and that they model their, their own work as soloists on his singing. And so his legacy lives on. But it's just incredibly tragic when people are struck down in the prime of life um, or get into trouble for singing about their art, which happened to him. Uh, and we talked about a range of organizations advocating in Canada because I thought that might be uh, a way for them to communicate their work or to reach out or for more collaboration um, because we do need that. And we talked about different kinds of events uh, and media coverage and um, Frankly, art is going on quite a bit within the advocacy communities, and it's very powerful. And we know that already. So it was important to me to relay that, this other art that's going on in the community, to relay that to the graduate students so that they could see it. And that's it. Uh, it's 6.55. <laughs> and that's the end of my talk. Thank you so much, Sheila. This is amazing. What an amazing course you taught. And, Thank and you. If the work um, the students came up with, and I really like how you rolled it, how you started it, you know, kind of start with a history. Where did this all originate? And I 